Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sankang Namasami Um, we're having a very diverse group today. We're having some university professors and we have some long-term practitioners, but we also have quite a few newbies. So I know that for some of you, today might be the first time that you actually read an early Buddhist text. So um, today uh, is just um, the introduction. I'm going to talk about the general background, about the origin of our text, and about a little bit of the historical background, how texts developed. So we're not going to talk about any specific ancient nuns, any specific theories today. And I see people are still joining slowly one by one, so that's very good. Um, but um, I'm going to start with the presentation now, and hopefully there will, I mean, definitely there will be time for question and answer at the end. And I will share my screen. So, as I just mentioned, for some reason, I still see Saba Mita instead of myself. So I don't know what's going on there. Very strange. Anyway, let's just uh, get started. Um, Today, as I just mentioned, we're talking about the origin and the development of our text. And I very much hope that we will have the time to read an abbreviated version of the story of the First Council. And the First Council in Pali is called the First Sangiti, often also translated as the communal recitation. And that is an event in Buddhist history that took place um, very shortly after the Buddha's Parinibbana. And uh, this was a group, the tradition says 500 monks, 500 Arahant monks, uh, all of them male monks, so Bhikkhunis and women were not represented in the First Council, who came together to collect the Buddha's teaching and make sure that it is preserved for the future generations. And because of the structure of how this First Council was held, that had a huge impact on how the women's stories and women's voices were preserved in the tradition. So I'm very much hoping that we will read, um, we'll have the time to read that today. I think we should have. And if there's more time, we are also going to um, read a short um, extract from the Mahapajapati Gautami Appadana. Um, and Appadana is a legend. So this is a legend about the life of Mahapajapati Gautami. And so the texts we will work with in our course are, I put them here in order of historical date. So the first ones, the foundational ones, of course, are the suttas, also called sutras or discourses from collections that are called in Pali, the four Nikayas in Sanskrit and in Chinese are called the Agamas. But um, that is just, um, somebody else is joining, sorry. That is just uh, another word for the same thing. So we have the Diga Nikaya, the Majima Nikaya, the Samyutta Nikaya, the Angutra Nikaya, and the parallels in the Agamas. People who are familiar with the Sutra Pitaka know that I've just uh, left out the Kudaka Nikaya, the fifth Nikaya, because that is not a text from the um, earliest time of Buddhism. The majority of content in the Kudaka Nikaya actually um, developed at a later time. But uh, one collection that is there and that is very, very important for our course are the Terigata verses. So we have just had the Terigata festival. So I'm assuming that most people would be familiar with the words. The Terigata are verses of the senior nuns. The Bhikkhunis at the Buddha's time, 
And this is a collection that is hugely important uh, for women in Buddhism because this is almost the only collection we have where we have women's voices um, being preserved, where we have the actual women's perspective on uh, and, and their description of how they um, experience their life, how they practice, how it, the, the living situations they are in, and um, their description of their environment and how and how they all attained enlightenment. So this is very very different from the vast majority of the rest of the suttas, because those, as I just mentioned, were collected by monks. So we have a male perspective on the women, but we don't really have the women's own voices. And because of the way the suttas were collected, we actually have many thousands of suttas preserved from the Buddha and from uh, the early disciples. But the vast majority of these suttas were spoken by men and the discourses spoken by women weren't actually preserved because they were not represented in the first council. So of the thousands of suttas that we have in the Sutta Pitaka, we have less than 20 where women actually play any kind of major role. So there are very, very few suttas that portray the women's own voices, but in the Terigata verses we have that and that's why it's uh, so hugely important to understand the situation there. And the next text, we are going to work with uh, the Vinaya text. And uh, Vinaya is uh, the Pali and Sanskrit name for the monastic law. So the rules that bhikkhus and bhikkhunis keep. And those Vinaya texts have evolved over a very long period of time, definitely several centuries. So there is a core, ma core material um, in the Vinaya mostly the bare bone rules themselves and a few of the uh, monastic procedures that were very likely laid down by the Buddha himself. So they go back to the Buddha's lifetime. But um, those rules are nowadays embedded in other material, kind of like an early commentary that explains the origin of the rule. There's an origin story that explains um, a situation, this and this happened. A uh, monk or nun misbehaved and people were upset and then a rule was laid down and there are case studies and there are word definitions and exceptions and many other stories. So the Vinaya we have nowadays is a lot more than just the rule and that has developed over a long period of time. And we know that it has developed over a long period of time because um, these Vinaya collections are preserved until today in um, different versions, each belonging to a different school of Buddhism. And we know that those schools um, came into being a few centuries after the Buddha. So in the early period of Buddhism, um, the Sangha was still uh, united. And then after a while, um, differences emerged and the United Sangha um, broke into several schools. Tradition says 18 schools. So, all those schools inherited the material that was there before them, like the very early material, but then they all developed it into their own directions. So by comparing all this, we can see regional differences. We can also see what is comparatively older, what is comparatively newer. And because all the rules have origin stories, we can also see the living conditions of nuns at different times, at different points in time. So the vineyards will be very um, important also for our course. And um, we're also going to work with what is called Appadanas. So those are legends of the Buddha and his early disciples, his early monks and nuns, monk and nun disciples. So um, those Appadanas also developed over many centuries after the Buddha's time. And we can see a very clear difference, for example, when we, we will compare Terigata verses from the earliest period with the Apadanas that um, came into being at a later time. And Apadanas are usually very much embellished stories. 
Um, they contain a lot of miracles, a lot of supernatural elements. And um, yeah, something that we will work with also in our course. And lastly, we are going to work with the commentaries. Um, in the Pali tradition, the most famous commentaries are the ones that were written by a monk called Buddha Gotha. And he came from India to Sri Lanka in four, around, around 420 CE. And he wrote the commentaries after that. So that is roughly, roughly a thousand years after the Buddha. So um, when we read the commentaries, we have a glimpse into a text that was um, written at an even later date, so 1,000 years after the Buddha. And um, of course, Buddha Gosa didn't completely make up the commentary. He based himself, his work on earlier works. So again, there is a continuity there. But anyway, we will see um, how Buddha Gosa related to women at this um, later point in time. And just have to get some water. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the women in the text. Of course, this is something we are going to explore in this course. So I just want to give a brief introduction. So what we are going to see is that in the Buddha's lifetime, the women had relative freedom. Um, there were thriving female renunciate movements at the Buddha's time. So around the Buddha, there were other uh, renunciate movements. Buddhism wasn't the only religion that was practiced at the time. And all, uh, most of those movements, or all, maybe all, maybe most, had um, female sanghas, um, so that women practicing as renunciates in those movements. Uh, for example, our text mentions female Jains, female Ajivakas, um, also female wanderers that were unaffiliated with any movement, so they were just independent and did their own thing. Um, the Terigata, um, in the Terigata, women tell us that they were practicing Brahmin rituals before they um, converted to Buddhism. So that's very interesting because in the centuries after that, in Brahmanism, women were no longer able to practice the rituals on their own. They had to rely on men to carry out rituals for them. Um, but at that time, women still tell us that they did the rituals themselves. So that's um, very interesting. Um, we, we know, we have a sutta that tells us of a female Brahmin teacher teaching male students, and we have to assume in the sacred knowledge of the Brahmins, the Vedas. So that sutta is attested in the Pali tradition, in Sanskrit, and in Chinese. Um, so very, very well attested across um, different schools. We have constantly mentions of women that were head of households. We have a mention of um, the famous lay woman, Visaka, who had um, a court case and uh, was uh, dealing directly with King Pasenadi. So definitely women could also represent themselves in court. And generally the environment was um, quite favorable for, for women. And so sometimes um, it is said that um, uh, when we look at our texts and we see that um, you know the Buddha, uh, the Buddha supposedly placed all kinds of restrictions on the female sangha and sub subordinated them to the monks, um, the, the justification that is given for that is often, oh well, because it was so unusual for the Buddha's time. And there was no other Sangha and he did such a radical thing. Um, that's why he had to put all these restrictions in place because otherwise nobody would have accepted it. Actually, when we look at the early texts, that is not at all what we see. We see um, a lot of um, very independent women and a lot of other female renunciate movements. So this is one very interesting difference that we are going to see when we compare earlier texts with later texts. And then after the Buddha's lifetime, as I mentioned, the first council, the first Sangiti happened. Um, a group of male monks came together and um, collected the teachings. Um, the 
Sama, the sutras, and the vinaya. So, to um, preserve it for later generations. So, that was obviously a very important thing to do. And I think every Buddhist has a, a huge gratitude to the First Council for doing that. So, when later we are examining the narrative of the First Council in a critical way, that um, I still want to say first that, you know, all Buddhists should be hugely grateful to the First Council for doing the work that they did. But of course, um, women are not represented in the First Council. So the texts of women were not collected in the First Council. So whatever sutras the Buddha gave to the female Sangha or whatever sutras women, um, bhikkhunis gave to each other or maybe to monks or maybe to lay people are not collected except for a very, very small amount, as I mentioned before, less than 20 um, sutras. And we will also see that monks who are supporting the bhikkhunis are censured in the first council and they re receive pressure from the other monks. So um, what seems evident when we look at the narrative of the first council is that in the early Sangha, after the Buddha's passing, there were tensions, there were different streams, there were different groups, and they were a little bit struggling with each other to determine the future course that the Sangha should take. And um, on the one side, there is a group that is usually associated with uh, Mahakasapa. And Mahakasapa is well, well known for being a very ascetic monk, being very reclusive, also being very strict and for being very critical of bhikkhunis and of women. And on the other hand, there is a group associated with Ananda usually, and Ananda is well known to be very um, approachable, um, also fairly close to lay people, so not very reclusive. And he also is well known to be a strong supporter of the bhikkhunis. So we see that uh, those two groups had, um, had some tensions between them. And in the first council, we see that um, the groups of, um, around Mahakasapa um, apparently prevailed over the Ananda group. And what that means for women is something that we can also explore. And that's why I think it's so much, it, it's worth really spending time today focusing on the narrative of the first council. So because Mahakasapa prevailed in the first council and because he was a a promoter of very strict practice. Um, there was a period where the Vinaya was developed a lot and where it became much tighter, where a lot of new rules were laid down. And especially a lot of rules were also um, um, laid down or maybe imposed on the female Sangha, which is also something that we are going to explore in this course. And um, Probably that wasn't only because um, some parts of the male Sangha were um, 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 were not very happy with, ha with having the bhikkhunis around. Um, it very well uh, could also reflect um, a general development in the society at that time. As I mentioned, things also got difficult for women in other religions and for women in society in general. We, we know that, for example, from the Brahmin uh, tradition. So it's possible that uh, the additional Vinaya rules that were imposed on women could also reflect that women in society in general had a lower status in the decades and centuries after the Buddha's passing. Um, but um, we also know that um, in India, traditionally, there wasn't given that much value to historical accuracy. So um, the additional Vinaya rules that were put into place were ascribed to the Buddha. So um, in the text, it seems like the Buddha himself lays down those rules. And of course, that is a, a means to authenticate the rules and to make sure that nobody questions them. And of course, nobody can question the Buddha um, because he is the fully awakened um, Arahant and the founder and leader of our religion. So um, if we think that all the rules were laid down by the Buddha, then of course we, um, we have like we have no leeway 
to um, later again discuss them and um, abolish them or modify them. So um, once um, rules were there that explicitly said that um, women have to bow to men, uh, bhikkhunis have to bow to bhikkhus and, and made it very clear that there is no gender equality in the Sangha, then um, those kind of attitudes um, continued um, throughout the centuries and throughout the millennia. And we can still very, very clearly see that until now. So as a bhikkhuni, because I live this lifestyle, I experience this literally all the time. Um, so definitely these ancient texts continue to have a very strong influence on Buddhists and Buddhist societies, even in the modern day. So um, now um, I would like to move on to read with you the story of the first council. And we are going to use the account that is given in the Pali tradition. And we find um, very similar stories about the first council in all Vinaya traditions. But I'm reading the Pali version with you today because um, it's the easiest accessible version and there are lots of translations. So it's um, um, the easiest also to read. And if there's time, as I mentioned before, we are going to read the Mahapajapati Gotami Apadana as well. So hopefully you can see this now. This is the text, um, which says the origin account of the communal recitation. So communal recitation, as I mentioned before, is another name for the first council. Then the Venerable Mahakasapa addressed the monk. On one occasion, I was traveling from Pava to Kusinara. Kusinara is the place where the Buddha attained um, Parinibbana. With a large Sangha of 500 monks. And I left the road and sat down at the foot of a tree. Just then, a follower of the Ajivakas was traveling towards Pava on the same road. The Ajivakas is a, another renunciate movement, a non-Buddhist movement. So just another... Um, religious wanderer. Um, so he was traveling on the same road, holding a coral tree flower that he had picked up in Kusinara. When I saw him coming, I asked him, do you know anything about our teacher? I do. Today it's seven days since the ascetic Gautama, that is the Buddha, attained final extinguishment. That's why I carry this coral tree flower. So I have slightly abbreviated the text here. And um, these dot 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 just says that all the Arahans were equanimous and everybody who was not an Arahant was uh, grieving and lamenting. On that occasion, a monk called Subhadda, who had gone forth when old, was part of that group. He said to the monks, please stop grieving, stop lamenting. It's good that we are freed from that great ascetic. We were oppressed always being told what's allowable and what isn't. Now we can do what we like and not do what we don't like. So Subhata is rejoicing that the Buddha has passed away. And of course, Mahakasapa is greatly alarmed. And he says, so then let's recite the teaching that is the sutras and the monastic law, the Vinaya together before what is contrary to the teaching shines forth and the teaching is obstructed. Before what is contrary to the monastic law shines forth and the monastic law is obstructed. Before those who speak contrary to the teaching become strong and those who speak in accordance with it become weak. Before those who speak contrary to the monastic law become strong and those who speak in accordance with it become weak. So Mahakasapa organizes the first council with the express purpose to preserve the Dhamma and the Vinaya so that there is uh, one version that is authenticated by the tradition and later generations will know what is the true Dhamma and what, um, what isn't. And I think it's clear that if the first council had not happened and if we hadn't had um, these um, collections of texts 
then um, I think definitely um, it would have been, the Dhamma would have been lost quite quickly. Um, because, I mean, you need a very concerted effort to preserve this um, large amount of text. So huge depth of gratitude of all Buddhists uh, to, to the first council, I think. So anyway, the text continues. Well then, venerable, please select the monks. Mahakasapa then selected 499 perfected ones, that means arahants, and the monks said to him, there is Venerable Ananda, who, although still a trainee, is incapable of acting from desire, ill will, confusion of fear. He has learned many teachings and much monastic law in the presence of the Buddha. Please inv invite him as well. And he did. So um, this paragraph here, I think, is included to already tell us that Mahakasapa was uh, kind of hesitant to include the Venerable Ananda in the first council. So we, we can see, we can already sense that there are some tensions between Mahakasapa and Ananda. Um, and um, because other monks had to actually um, explicitly ask him to invite the Venerable Ananda to the council. And in the texts of other schools, um, this is even more explicit. So in those texts, sometimes the monks really, really have to pressure Mahakasapa and ask him over and over. Um, to um, until he finally includes uh, Venerable Ananda. So the senior monks then went to Rajagaha to recite the teaching and the monastic law. And you can see I've again left out a small portion. This is where the monks do repairs and uh, make preparations. Um, and then the Venerable Ananda thought, it would not be proper for me to go to the assembly tomorrow if I'm still a trainee. That, that means he's still a stream enterer, he's not an arahant. And after spending most of the night with mindfulness directed to the body, early in the morning he bent over to lie down in the interval between his feet coming off the ground. Oh, somebody else is joining. Coming off the ground and his head hitting the pillow, his mind was freed from the corruptions without grasping. And Venerable Ananda went to the assembly as a perfected one. And then Venerable Mahakasapa informed the Sangha, please, I ask the Sangha to listen. If it seems appropriate to the Sangha, I will ask Upali about the monastic law. Venerable Upali informed the Sangha, please, Venerable, I ask the Sangha to listen. If it seems appropriate to the Sangha, I will reply when asked by Venerable Mahakasapa about the monastic law. In this way, he asked about the analysis of both monastic codes, and Upali was able to reply to every question. So here we, we see how they collected um, the monastic law, the Vinaya. And um, as we see, the bhikkhunis were not represented, but their monastic code was recited. So both monastic codes means the um, rules of the monks and the rules of the nuns. And up until today, we can still see in the structure of the Vinaya, um, this exact division that was done in the first council and the fact that women were not represented there is also very clear in the Vinaya. So when we look at the Vinaya, um, the part that is for monks is a complete text where every single rule is explained in much detail. And the part for the nuns um, is very much incomplete. So monks and nuns have a very large number of rules that they, that they share in common. And then each Sangha also has rules that are uh, separate for only for them. Um, and the um, part in the Vinaya that uh, is for the Bikunis only has those rules that are specific for them. And when we want to look up things about all the other rules, the rules that we share with the Bikus, then we have to go to um, the Biku text and look them up there. And of course, then the rules are phrased from a male perspective. And usually that's not a big problem because we can just uh, substitute the genders and then we know what the rule is about. But there are some rules where that's not really possible because men and women are just different and their anatomy is different and some other things are also different. So um, sometimes the explanation doesn't really match um, for the bhikkhunis. 
So we end up with rules that don't have a proper explanation for us. So that is a very big lack that we still feel until today. And also because bhikkhunis were not there and because they did not uh, recite their own monastic code, the monks um, recited rules that they weren't really practicing. So they didn't really have uh, that much knowledge about them. And so the explanations we have about our rules are very, very much shorter and very much superficial and very incomplete compared to the monks. And we also have some rules that are really strange where we can clearly see that celibate male monks um, preserve them because um, they describe very strange things about female, female anatomy, for example. So as women, we, we immediately know that um, this cannot possibly be true, um, but, for, for, but, but it, uh, we clearly see that a woman could never have uh, for, uh, phrased or formulated the text as it as we have it now. So up until today, we, we see um, what happened in the first council represented in our text, and also uh, we can clearly see that um, even over the next few centuries, when the vinya evolved and developed and broke into different schools, and we compare the versions of the different schools, the rules of the monks are very, very similar. We can almost say identical. And the rules of the nuns have quite a big variance. So clearly um, there was a lot less care uh, for, the, for the nuns' rules. And um, yeah, that is in part due to the structure of the First Council. Anyway, moving on, the Venerable Mahakasapa informed the Sangha. Please, I ask the Sangha to listen. If it seems appropriate to the Sangha, I will ask Ananda about the teaching, that is the sutras. Venerable Ananda informed the Sangha, these venerables, I ask the Sangha to listen. If it seems appropriate to the Sangha, I will reply when asked by Venerable Mahakasapa about the teaching. In this way, he recited about the five collections. In this way, he asked about the five collections and Ananda was able to reply to every question. So Ananda, according to tradition, Ananda single-handedly um, recited the um, almost the entire Sutra Pitaka. So here are the five collections I mentioned, which are the five Nikayas or Agamas. Um, but um, as I said before, at the at that point of the first council, only the first four um, collections were probably sort of complete, and the fifth collection was in a very preliminary state with only a very small number of texts in there. And nowadays, it is actually the biggest of the five Nikayas. Because mm. a lot of later texts were added. Anyway, at that point, the council normally should have ended because um, it was done for the purpose of reciting um, Dhamma and Vinaya, and that's what they did. But um, Ananda then says to the monks, At the time of his final extinguishment, the Buddha said to me, After my passing away, Ananda, if the Sangha wishes, it may abolish the lesser training rules. But Ananda, did you ask the Buddha, which are the lesser training rules? No, I didn't. Some senior monks asked, some senior monks said, apart from the four rules entailing expulsion, the rest are the lesser training rules. Others said, apart from the four rules entailing expulsion and the 13 rules entailing suspension, the rest are the lesser training rules. And again, I've put dot, dot, dot here because now a lot of monks speak up and everybody makes different suggestions, what are the lesser training rules? And it's a long paragraph, so I have left that out. The Venerable Mahakasapa informed the Sangha. Please, I ask the Sangha to listen. If it seems appropriate to the Sangha, the Sangha should not lay down new rules, nor get rid of the existing ones, and it should undertake to practice the training rules as they are. The Sangha approves and is therefore silent. I will remember it thus. So because the monks cannot agree which ones are the minor rules, they just decide to keep all the rules, but they also make an explicit decision not to lay down new rules. And that's very interesting because um, as we will see that rule, this decision wasn't even kept for five minutes. Um, and we also know that um, throughout the centuries, the Vinaya evolved uh, to a great extent and a lot of new rules were added actually. Um, but it's interesting that they actually made this um, decision not to lay down new rules that is expressly mentioned here in the text. 
And then um, suddenly the senior monks all turn against Ananda and start to accuse him of all sorts of things. So um, what then happens is the senior monks said, you have committed an act of wrong conduct, Ananda, in that you didn't ask the Buddha, which are the lesser training rules? Confess that wrong conduct. And Ananda says, it was because of lack of mindfulness that I didn't ask, which are the lesser training rules? I can't see that I have committed any wrong conduct, but I confess it out of faith in the venerables. So we see that um, even though the monks just decided not to lay down new rules, they are coming up with a new rule that it is an offense that uh, people don't ask Buddhas about lesser training rules, which obviously is not a rule that is found anywhere in the Vinaya. That's just something that came up at that point. And um, they say it's a rule that needs to be confessed or an offense that needs to be confessed. And Ananda says, well, I cannot see that offense. I, I don't think I did anything wrong. But he doesn't want to have a big conflict with the rest of the Sangha, so he's just confessing it, even though he doesn't see the offense. And again, that's something that actually um, normally not possible in the Vinaya. In the Vinaya, um, you can only confess an offense if you actually see that you have done something wrong. So this whole procedure is quite strange, what's going on here. And what seems to be going on here is that um, well, Ananda just recited the entire Sutra Pitaka. So he's uh, obviously an extremely learned monk. He has also lived with the Buddha as his attendant for 25 years. He's also an Arahant now. So it would seem quite natural for the Sangha to turn towards Ananda for guidance at this point in time when the Buddha has passed away. But of course, as, we, as I mentioned before, there were tensions and there were different groups in the Sangha. So the monks, um, in the Mahakasapa group are now trying to show that um, Ananda is not actually a suitable guide um, or a suitable person to rely on because he has all those faults and because he has committed all kinds of um, offenses. So they're kind of trying to undermine Ananda's uh, credibility. That it seems uh, what is going on here. And then they accuse him of different things. He, and then they accuse him that he stepped, stepped on the Buddha's rainy season robe when he was sewing it. And again, Ananda says, I don't see that offense, but I'll confess it. Um, and again, that's a rule that was just made up. There, there is no rule in the Vinaya that says you cannot step on rainy season robes. Um, actually, it happens all the time when we sew robes and people step on it because robes are just huge. And um, they need a lot of space and usually kutis are small. So when you walk around, you kind of step on robes while you sew it. So that's entirely normal in the Sangha. And uh, so that's uh, kind of a little bit of a weird thing. Yeah, but again, this is um, just to show that uh, Ananda doesn't have the proper respect for Buddha and Buddhism in general. So it shouldn't be taken as a leader. And then things get interesting because the senior monks say, you have also committed an act of wrong conduct in that you had women pay respect to the Buddha's dead body first. They soiled the Buddha's body with tears, confess that wrong conduct. And Ananda says, I did this so that it wouldn't get too late for them. I can't see that I committed any wrong conduct, but I'll confess it out of faith in the venerables. So now um, there's quite open uh, um, misogyny here in the text, quite open hostility towards women uh, or quite, quite or maybe not hostility, but quite an open expression that uh, to say that women and men are not equal and it's not acceptable that women go first when the men should have gone first. Um, and Ananda just, Ananda doesn't share that position at all. He doesn't at all see the problem with doing that. He says he acted out of compassion so it wouldn't get too late for them. Um, but anyway, again, he confesses, he submits and confesses. And then they accuse him of another thing. He didn't ask the Buddha to live on for an eon. Um, and again, Ananda says he, didn't, he doesn't see the offense, but he will confess it again. And then finally, the last point is, you have committed an act of wrong conduct in that you made an effort for women to be given the going forth on the spiritual path proclaimed by the Buddha. Confess that wrong conduct. And so here we see 
um, that the uh, group around Maha Kasapa is really upset that there are that Bikunis exist, that there are women in the Sangha. Women should never have been given the going forth. That was a mistake that Ananda made, an offense. And now um, Ananda is made to confess an offense for having and having made it possible for women to go forth. Um, and this, uh, with this note, on, on this note, um, the first council concludes. And um, there is a small passage that follows it that is also interesting um, for us. And that reads, at the time, Venerable Purana was wandering in the southern hills with a large Sangha of 500 monks. So that means Purana had a very large following. He was probably a fairly influential monk at that time. When the senior monks had concluded the communal recitation of the teaching and the monastic law, and when Purana had stayed in the southern hills for as long as he liked, he went to the bamboo grove at Rajagaha. There he approached the senior monks, exchanged pleasantries with them, and sat down. And they said to him, Purana, the senior monks have jointly recited the teaching and the monastic law. Please accept that communal recitation. Uh, but Purana says, well, the teaching and the monastic law have been well recited by the senior monks. Nevertheless, I will remember what I myself have received in the presence of the Buddha. So um, Purana says, well, that's nice what you just did, but um, I am not going to submit to, to your version. I don't think that's authentic. I will keep uh, following what I myself have heard from the Buddha, which implies obviously that there is a discrepancy and that he has heard something that was different from what was recited in the first council. And that then shows that um, there was no, um, no consensus in the early Sangha. And again, it shows us that there were different groups and everybody was um, still trying to find their way. And not everybody accepted the version that the First Council produced as authentic. Um, and, um, so yeah, I put a link, I will put that in the chat later on. So if people want to read it, read the whole um, story without all the dot, dot, dots, um, you can uh, look it up yourself. It's freely available. And I think at this point in time, we are not going to read the Mahapajapa the Apadana anymore, but I just want to say a few words about it. So in the Mahapajapa the Apadana, um, well, as I mentioned, Apadanas are later legends. They evolved a long time after the life of the actual Mahapajapati. But um, it's quite common that those legends have a historical core that is then greatly embellished, um, but that there is some historical truth to um, some of the stories in the Apadanas. And what we read in the Mahapajapati Apadana is that um, when Mahapajapati heard that the Buddha was about to pass away, she decided that she would pass into Parinibbana first. And then the 500 nuns who were around Mahapajapati all also decided that they would pass away together with Mahapajapati. And then um, a large group of nuns um, led by the chief nun, the female chief nun Kema, she was the female counterpart to Sariputta, the foremost in wisdom, the female, the nun foremost in wisdom. Uh, and her large following, uh, which included probably other teachers, also decided that they would all pass away into Parinibbana before the, Buddha, before the Buddha goes. And if there is some historical truth to this, then that means that um, at the time of the first council, the female Sangha would have been very, very greatly diminished and all their um, leaders and teachers and guides would have gone and also a, a large number of just the ordinary nuns would have gone. So it's possible that at the time of the first council, the Sangha was, the female Sangha was in quite a weak state. And that might be another reason why the texts of the nuns weren't well preserved. Mm -hmm. And then as we have seen, um, 
there were tensions in the male Sangha concerning the role of the female Sangha. So the, in the decade, years, decades and centuries after the Buddha's passing, the female Sangha became a political matter in the male Sangha because, um, yeah, because of those uh, different groups and those different groups kind of um, um, trying to guide the Sangha in different directions. And once the female Sangha became political for the male Sangha, of course, it was very much more difficult for the women to preserve an independence and to do their own thing. So at this point, I would like to um, end my presentation and open up for questions and answers. And um, yeah, if anybody has any comments or questions or anything they want to share, then you can either type in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, yeah, just speak, whatever you're comfortable with. Anna Marie is uh, raising her hand, so if you like, you can speak. Thank you, Aya. Thank you so much. It's, it's really, really interesting. Um, what comes to my mind is um, the monks at the First Council, they were all Arahants. Yet, at least some of them, um, I, I'm trying to match the arahant with misogyny. Or is it, if, if my understanding of an arahant would be that the only, their only motivation could be like a, a loving one, mm -hmm. or is that a misunderstanding? Yeah, that, that's definitely a very good, very good question and something that many people have struggled with and are still struggling with, I think, even today, because even today, they are very accomplished teachers that we, we consider very accomplished and who also um, um, have opinions that are very similar to what we see in the First Council narrative. So, yeah, it, it's difficult to reconcile. And as we have seen at, at the at the Buddha's time, the Buddha didn't really have these kind of opinions. When we read the very early text, he, um, ha he created very favorable conditions for the Bhikkhuni Sangha. Um, so, yeah, what, what's going on? I, have, I also don't have a definite uh, conclusion. Um, but one thing also to keep in mind is that... Um, these are, these are texts, and the texts were obviously written after the fact. So the, the narrative of the first council was included into the canon at the second council, which happened a hundred years afterwards. So they didn't immediately preserve uh, um, a version of what happened at the first council. During the first council, they just um, um, sort of kept on telling the story until it was finally, a hundred years later, included into the canon. So what we have just read is what the tradition wanted to preserve about the First Council. It doesn't mean that that actually happened at the First Council. So we don't know who the monks are that um, composed those texts. Um, we don't know if they were all Arahants. Um, it's uh, just some, maybe just an opinion that was prevalent in the Sangha at the time of the Second Council. That is a possibility. Um, other than that, yeah, it, it's difficult. I um, I also find it very hard to reconcile. Yeah, Vanessa. Hi. Hi. Um, that was a beautiful presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank and you. You did that very skillfully. You definitely made your case very well. Um, you did. <laughs> so I guess the obvious question that comes with all of this is that if we're going to start asking the kinds of questions that you're asking, which we've been doing for a very long time of was this written at the Buddhist time? What is not written at the Buddhist time? What is produced by monks later for their own political agendas? Once we start down that road, it requires a tremendous amount of sophistication to stay on that road without the whole system collapsing. 
because we know, actually know which parts were said by the Buddha and which weren't. And so once we start allowing ourselves to open that door, how do you, I, like, I mean, I think you're right to ask all these questions. I've been thinking about them for many years, but I just wonder if you have an answer as to how do you keep the tradition without it collapsing once we start those questions. It's much easier to be a fundamentalist in other words, right? Because we just say, it's all from the Buddha, I'll follow all of it and I won't ask any questions. But now we're asking questions, we're saying, well, this might not have been written by the Buddha and this might not even been written by Mahakasapa. And right, once we start, I, how, how do you manage that road? Mm. I don't even know if there's an answer to that question, mm. but it's, it's definitely a challenging situation to be in. So for me personally, um... For me personally, it's very important to make a distinction between what is the actual teaching of the Buddha and what was added later, because um, I'm a Buddhist nun. I've dedicated my life to practicing the Buddha's teaching, and um, I want to practice what the Buddha actually taught, and because I think that is um, my best shot at um, you know actually developing on the path and not getting sidetracked, because what was written later is something that um, well, I, I can't have the same faith in it because um, people who, who wrote stuff later, they might have been enlightened, they might not have been enlightened. So for me, it's very, very important to make that distinction um, between what the Buddha taught and what he didn't ta uh, teach. And I think there are quite, uh, as you say, research has been going on now for, for quite a while, for more than a century in, in the Western countries and probably similar questions have been raised in, in Asia for a longer time. Um, so, I mean, through, basically throughout the, the last uh, uh, 2,500 years, similar questions have been asked. Um, and I think criteria have been established to, um, to, um, uh, to say which texts are very likely authentic and which texts are very likely inauthentic. So, um, for example, through comparative studies, we can already exclude a huge amount of texts um, because if they are all different in the different schools of Buddhism, then it seems very, very likely that um, they have developed at a later, later date. And then through textual analysis, we can also see which texts are earlier, which texts are later. Um, also, by studying as we are doing now by, by studying the, the background stories, we can see at which historical point in time this story was, was set. So we can see uh, if the stories match um, at society that obviously describes a later point in history, then that must be a later text. Um, so I think there are quite a number of criteria. I'm, I'm not an expert in that. I just um, have some superficial knowledge of that, but there are definitely quite a number of criteria to establish which, which texts are early and which texts are late. And um, so we can, we can actually say with a relative high certainty, um, which texts are more likely, which texts are very likely authentic and which aren't. And I know, I know that is very challenging for the tradition. That is definitely hugely challenging for the tradition. And, um, of course, there is a very strong belief in, in many traditional Buddhist societies that the, the texts are one monolithic block and that there is no contradiction there. And that, um, um, that you know, yeah, yeah, that there is no contradiction. But then when we read the actual text, instead of just believing that, then we see it, that it's full of contradictions. And somehow we have to make sense of that. So um, I think it's much better to, to actually start exploring and to try to find answers um, because by that we will actually advance our knowledge instead of just blindly believing that there are no differences because um, then we will never develop any kind of knowledge. So it's better to walk on, on the path and try to find out instead of just giving up from the start. But anyway, that, that's my approach, but I know other people do things differently. No, I think what you're saying is so important and it's so good to hear it said. And I think we need to say it more and more. Um, we, we talk about, you know, like to practice takes a tremendous amount of insight and nuance and attention to detail of the mind. And I think if we 
put the same kind of effort and the nuance and sophistication to study and not just accept everything blindly and also not just say, I can't do it, it's too complicated, but to sit down and really do the work, which is what you're suggesting and really try to figure it out. And we may, may make mistakes and we might be wrong on certain occasions, but to make that effort to mm. try to understand the history of the tradition and have that sophistication changes everything, right? It makes the difference mm. between fundamentalism and a lived exciting tradition that is investigating. Yeah, and so exactly. I think your answer is right. And I'm so excited to, yeah. you know, and I think that's why these classes are so important, right? It's, mm. it's encouraging us to keep studying and trying to figure it out. Mm. I think yeah, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> I see that Dana put a question into the chat. What reasons they gave for saying that Ananda was wrong in regard to starting the female Sangha? In the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, Buddha said he intended to establish fourfold assembly or Sangha and his task was then done. Yes, exactly. Um, exactly, Dana. Um, that is uh, exactly that is basically one point why we see that uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta is, belongs to the earlier text. And the council belongs to a somewhat later kind of text because there is the discrepancy there. The later texts support uh, the Bhikkhuni Sangha. And there are other suttas. There's one in the Majjhimanikaya where the wanderer Vachagota comes to the Buddha and he asks him if in the Buddha's teaching there are any, even one single Bhikkhuni who has actually attained, who has actually walked the path and attained Arahanship. And the Buddha says, well, not only one, we have more than 500. Um, Bikunis who have done that, and then uh, the wanderer Vachagota says, um, rejoices, and he says, um, well, if there were no Bikunis that were accomplished, then your teaching would be deficient, but because the Bikunis are there, that's why in that respect your teaching is complete. So that Vachagota at that point wasn't, wasn't even Buddhist, he was just a random wanderer, like a general member of society, and that was just a pre, uh, the prevalent opinion at the time that, that women need to have the, the same opportunities and that um, a teaching that doesn't offer opportunities to women is deficient. So the text doesn't actually give any reasons um, for saying that uh, why Ananda was wrong. The text, we have just read the text. They, there is nothing, I haven't hidden anything from the text. The text is as it is. Um, so we are left to, to wonder what's going on. And probably the monks at that time thought it was self-explanatory. As I said, if the text was actually um, uh, finalized a hundred years after the Buddha, that would have been at a time when the status of women in society would have been uh, lower than what it was at the Buddha's time. So at that point, it might have been self-explanatory that uh, women should not have the same opportunities that men have. So maybe the council didn't feel any need to go into more detail at that point. Okay, if there are no more questions, then maybe we will finish for today. I have two more announcements to make. One is a huge thank you to the Rain Bodhi group in Sydney. They are allowing us to use their Zoom account. So because uh, they are generous, we can have this um, course um, today and um, the next few weeks. So Rain Bodhi is a Buddhist group for LGBTQIA plus people and their allies. They are in Sydney and they're hosting regular events. And uh, I just want to say, thank you so much for helping us out. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to say if uh, what we have discussed today was interesting for you, I am teaching another course, which is called the Transition Years. And that is a sutta study course where we're only going to read suttas. And we are going to talk about the time, the preparations of the Buddha and the Sangha for the Buddha's Parinibbana, and then his actual Parinibbana, and then how the Sangha developed in the years and decades after that um, by reading suttas of the Pali Canon. And uh, that course will start tomorrow and it will be on every Tuesday um, at the same time as this meeting today. So in whatever time zone you are, whatever time you came today will be the same time tomorrow. 
and it will be uh, not on Zoom, that will be on YouTube, on the Buddhist Insights YouTube channel. So if you're interested, you can join there. But um, anyway, it's not, uh, this course is a standalone course here. So if you don't want to join the other course, that's also fine, you don't have to, they don't have much to do with, with each other. Um, so, um, oh, I promise, oh, I actually just remember that I promised you to put the links in the chat. So I, I just quickly do that. So these are two links for the first council narrative and for the Mahapajapati Gotami Apadana. Um, and I will also put right, uh, the Buddhist Insights channel. You can search it on YouTube and it's um, easy to find. Um, okay, and then we can finish up for today with uh, three sadhus. So if you want to join, please join in. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And see you all next time.